said that reading makes you more empathetic. It's a way to escape your own life. It can take you into faraway lands and put you into people's shoes. It can even help you keep your brain healthy and sleep better. In today's show, we're going to be introducing you to Jan Becky and about her book, American Bastard. Don't go away. We'll be right back with this very, very interesting backstory. If you're just joining us, then a very warm welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgetti Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa, and our live stream is made possible by Creative Edge, StreamYard, and BeLive Media. A special warm welcome to you, our audience, whether you are joining us over on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Twitter, and also over on Amazon Live. Just a reminder that this is an interactive live show, which means that you can talk to our author, you can ask us questions, post them. And um, today in our show, we're going to be talking to another amazing author, Jan Beatty, about her book, American Bastard. So if this is the first time you are watching the Writer's Corner live show, we have been going live for three and a half years, and we'd love to give you a shout out if you are in the comments today. Mary Elizabeth Jackson, my amazing friend and co-host, is unable to join us today. Um, we wish her well and hoping that she would be able to join us again next week on the Writer's Corner live show. But before we bring up our amazing uh, guest again today, the author Jan Beatty, uh, we are all about helping you level up. And one of the things that everyone has to do these days is to appear on live video uh, talking about their book goods products and services and in this case about their books and it's something that authors had to do um, they had to pivot because in-person live events is not possible so if you're an author out there or anyone else out there that's needing to use video there are a few things that you can do to look your best on camera one of the things i use for example is the logitech brio camera um, the Logitech Brio camera has got trademarked right light HDR technology, which means that it automatically adjusts to the lighting situation, um, whatever that may be that you've got. And um, that's my one as it is mounted. So that helps you look professional. And then also, um, if you are wanting to increase or have better audio, I recommend the Samsung, which is the studio condenser microphone that I'm currently using. But you can also opt for something smaller, which is the Rode microphone. I recommend that. But either way, do invest in something that's going to give you good audio because you want to make sure that people can actually hear um, your message. So do, do invest in something like that. Also, something else that you can use um, for your live streaming, especially for those of you who don't have software that you use for your live streaming, um, and you have to use your phone, which is perfectly fine. But I do recommend that you use something like um, this little gimbal, which will help you stabilize your live stream. Or alternatively, you could use something like that. But either way, you want to make sure that you do the best when you um, when you invest in in this. So let us bring on our amazing guest for today, Jan Beatty. She's the winner of the Red Hand Nonfiction Award for her memoir, American Bastard. Her sixth book, um, Body Wars, was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. Jan Beatty's new poems in the Body Wars, and we'll bring you that at another time, um, is also an amazing um, book that you would want to read. 
So without any further ado, let's welcome Jan Beatty. Jan, welcome. It is great to have you on the Welk on the Writers Corner live show today. Thank you so so much for uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks, Prajati. I'm so excited to be here. You are an absolute. You are an accomplished author. Tell us a little bit about your journey um, in becoming an author. Um, how did you get how did you even get started as an author who encouraged you was it something that your parents encouraged you as a child um or is it something that a teacher encouraged you how did you become first become an author uh well that that's kind of a long journey uh as it is with most writers i think uh but um my new book american bastard is about being adopted and so uh my adoptive parents uh did not encourage me in that way, but um, I was uh, I was born in a place called Rosalia Asylum and Maternity Hospital, and I was uh, in that uh, orphanage for the first year of my life. And so it took a lot of years to believe that uh, I could be a writer, although I wrote during my whole growing up period, sort of as a way to stay alive as a way to believe uh, that I could be here and have something to say. But that was all private stuff that was in locked diaries and, you know, under the bed kind of stuff. And uh, so that I didn't show to anyone. And I never believed that I could ever be a writer. I thought that was for other people. I, I didn't know who that was, people who had money maybe. But, um, you know, I was the only one in my family who went to college, neither of my adoptive parents uh, finished high school. So it was a great privilege to go to college. And so I never never thought I could study writing. Uh, I, I got a degree in social work uh, because I wanted to do some good. And I was a pretty terrible social worker, dropped out after um, five years of doing that and became a waitress. And only then I went back to writing and started taking one writing class at a time at the University of Pittsburgh. And then I found um, a teacher, uh, Ed Ochester, who was a great teacher who encouraged me. So it was a long, long trip to get there. Uh, and I, my first book came out when I was 39 years old. So, Wow, that is amazing. So how did American Bastard come about because that is also a very very interesting story <laughs> yeah that that book um it sounds hard to believe but it took me like 20 years to write that book uh, again it's it's based it's a memoir based on adoption and i it was emotional it was hard to get the information it was hard to get you know my story my my real name you know, all the information took years to get to find my birth mother. So it took 20 years to write. I never thought it would be published and uh, uh, sent it out for four years and was just about to give up when uh, when Red Hen, um, when it won the Red Hen nonfiction contest. So it just, I just kept going with it. Um, and it was something I was driven to write. So I was really grateful that that it got through eventually. Mm. So this is a very personal story. Um, and I always like to ask authors, I mean, writing by itself is, is a personal thing because you taking something that is close to your heart that reveals something about yourself and you're making that available publicly. How did it feel? Feel to share something that was so deeply personal um, with with the world. Well, I think that's one reason it took twenty years was because, you know, I wasn't I wasn't mature enough as a human being uh, or as a writer to do that yet, and I kept running into roadblocks, uh, emotional roadblocks. You know, I was I had been in therapy for many years, but I had to 
you know, continue to work on the adoption part of things uh, because it's it's really, um, you know, it's about trauma. So uh, I had to do more work on that. And then I didn't know how to write that story. And I had to, you know, mature as a writer also. Um, and then still, as you said, there was the fear of, of telling this story. Um, I didn't know, and it was, you know, I wanna be clear that it's, it is my story, but it's not just about me. I wanted to write about, you know, how the culture looks at adoption and to, you know, sort of tell the tell it from the adoptee's point of view, which in my estimation has not been told yet. Um, the the American culture at least whitewashes this this idea of adoption, trying to make it nice and happy. And, you know, it's not always that way. So that mm. was that was really the the part that was driving the book. And I, I you know, there is a lot about adoption, positive and negative, um, out there, and, and and somewhere there's the truth in between. And I th I think you were wanting to somehow give people a glimpse of uh, the truth. Right, the truth as I as I know it as an adoptee who's lived it, and um, and I I've been to I've been t I've read a lot about it. I've gone to adoptee meetings, adoptee conferences. I've worked on it in therapy, as I said, and. Um, most adoptees are not willing to search, or if they are, they're not willing to talk about it. There's so much shame around it. There's so much withholding around it. So this this story hasn't been told. You know, um, you're right. There's there's a lot out there, positive and negative. Uh, this I was just really trying to complicate everything here, and I'm not anti-adoption at all. I just want it to be looked at in a more open and complex way. Mm. Jan, tell me a bit about the cover of the book, because I'm always fascinated about how people um, decided on on the cover. Okay, so you have the cover up there. Yeah, I have the cover here. It's um, so this is uh, a picture of me at six years old. Um, I was obviously a tomboy, so I'm shirtless, uh, pointing pointing a toy shotgun at the camera, and so obviously I I'm wearing high tops. I'm I'm angry. I'm an angry little kid, and I knew that I it was kind of uh, in, it was very intuitive. I knew if I ever published this book that this would be the cover. I had a vision about it. I felt like it would be red and black. I just saw it happening many years before. And so that's one thing that kept me going with the writing because I, I had seen the cover, you know, a vision of the cover, um, you know, not in a dream, but I did, had just it, it imagined it and it came to be. So this was uh, an actual photo, and I f that I found the photo is kind of amazing, <laughs> you know. And um, you know, I didn't, you know, my adoptive parents are no longer alive. Um, I don't know if my birth mother is still alive. Um, I didn't talk to any of my relatives before I published the book. Um, I feel like it's my story, and. I, I firmly believe that no matter what a writer is writing, that um, writing is no place to settle scores. Writing is no place to, you know, get back in anyone. And that's that's not what this is about. This is about, as I said, trying to complicate the idea of adoption and and tell tell my story. You mentioned a very some very valid points there because I think um, that often holds people back, including myself. You know, how do you get to the point where you um, realize that it is your story? Um, you know, and even if it involves other members of your family, um, it's not about them. It's not for them. It's for yourself. It's about yourself. And you're writing it from your perspective. Um, and you're not doing it to your family members, because I think that's often 
um, how it's perceived. It it really has nothing to do with them. It has all about it's all about yourself and wanting to heal yourself. Right, and you know it's it's not therapy. It's you know I believe it's not therapy. It's not healing. It's although that may be a side benefit. It's about writing the best book I can write about this. And um, but but I agree with you. And and I've I've taught for thirty years, and I tell my students, look if you know, this is your life, your time on earth. What do you want to say? You know, you have the right to write whatever you want to write and, you know, do it now, say it now. Nobody can tell you, you know, what you should or shouldn't write. Um, and, you know, having said that, you want to have integrity about what you're doing and you want to, you know, you know, really run everything through that, you know, that, you um, you know, that integrity and say, you know, is this the way it happened? Is this fair minded? Is this the best story I can write in the best way? So there's, I mean, that's one, one reason everything takes so long because if you're trying to, you know, work with the craft of writing, deal with the, uh, you know, any, any moral judgments that you're making along the way, it gets very complicated really fast. Mm. So. I can imagine how complicated it is writing something like this because you, you're wanting to tell your story, be authentic as you possibly can be, be informative, but you also want to write it in a manner where it makes for compelling writing so that people would want to read your story. So there's a fine balance between making all those things work and turning it into um, – a piece of literature that people would want to read. Exactly. And that's where the craft of writing comes in. And, you know, this went through like nine versions and I had, you know, many people read it, give me feedback. And, you know, look, it's just because, as I told my students, just because something happened to you doesn't make it interesting. No one really cares what happened to you, you know. Um, you might, but um, the the point is, what makes, what is the compelling story? What makes the book, you know, interesting and necessary to read? And if you don't have that story, don't write it. And I felt like there was something there that, well, that I was certainly compelled to write about. And that's why this the whole memoir is focused on adoption. Um, uh, for example, I've been married for almost 30 years and my husband doesn't appear in the book. I mean, it barely, I think he appears in one line or something. So it's not about my life because my life's not that interesting. It's it's about um, being adopted and that journey of adoption. Mm, yeah, I, I totally get that. Can I ask you, is it possible for you to read something out of the book that uh, will give people a, a kind of a sense um, of, of what your story is about. Sure. Um, I'll start with something towards the beginning. Um, so, um, so the dedication of the book is, this is for the lost ones who never knew where they came from. Uh, this is against the ones who pretended the loss never happened. And as I said, I was born in a place called Rosalia Asylum and Maternity Hospital in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. And it was called a home for unwed mothers. At that time, women would go there, have their babies, leave the babies there, and it functioned as an orphanage. So I was there the first year of my life. Um, and this uh, is about that time in Rosalia, or refers to that time. After the tearing and rolling, after the tearing and rolling, you're an infant somewhere in a crib, in a room full of cribs. Someone is taking care of you. You don't know who. Who is the person who picks you up? Is it a woman? Is it a nun? There is no story in sight. No same loving face, blood of my blood face. The smells, the feel of the rolling and tearing are gone. Gone where? No face who has your face. No way of knowing who is who, what hands are these? Why are they different every time? There is no bonding taking place. 
The story is fractured here and forever after. Then strangers come to gaze at you, touch you, wonder about you. They decide to pluck you out of there and make you theirs. These strangers will take your name away and hide it. The government will cooperate. It will take months and months for this baby trade to be completed, a baby in exchange for money. Meanwhile, someone is feeding you. Is it a kind person? What do they smell like? You will never know these hands again. You will be taken to a strange place. People will start calling you the lucky one, the chosen baby. No one sees that your story is gone, that you are being handed off like a football. From now on, everyone will pretend that your first story never existed. They will act and want you to act as if you are one of them, their blood, their faces, their world. You know that to survive, you will have to do this. You will have to pass. But your new mother has dark hair and brown eyes. Your father has dark hair. Their noses are not like yours. Your white blonde hair shines sickly like the odd light in a bad painting. Later, you look at your cousins. They have beautiful long eyelashes, all of them the same. You value how others resemble others. You long for it. In first grade, you refuse to make a family tree. Your parents and teacher suggest you make one based on your new family. You refuse. Jan, that is very, very, very touching. And, um, you know, just listening to you read that section um, definitely would make me and anyone I, I know think would want to read the book. So for anyone watching this uh, on Amazon Live, um, the book is in the carousel. So please, you know, reach out, get a copy of, of this amazing book. Um, how do you feel now that the book is out there? Um, you know, I can, I can, you know, sort of. I'm, I'm sure there must have been a lot of anxiety bef before <laughs> you actually published the book. But now that your story is out there, how does it make you feel? That's a good question. I was, I was really, really freaked out before the book came out, and I thought, oh maybe I shouldn't have done this and but it was too late and I thought oh my and uh, I felt really vulnerable really vulnerable and then after I did a couple readings public readings um, and I did one in Youngstown I did one uh, um, I did a couple large uh, you know public readings uh, I did my book launch in uh, in Pasadena with Red Hen and uh, after that, it was it was fine because I I got some really good really good responses. Um, I was afraid that you know I don't know what I thought. I was making up things in my head. I was thinking that you know adoptive uh, mothers were going to be angry with me. People were going to be angry with me, and I would be okay if they were. Um, but that that hasn't happened yet. I'm sure it will. Um, but I've got a lot of positive responses. And, and what happened is that I felt really so much better just having this out. I felt like finally I'm not struggling to get it out. It's out and it has a life of its own. And, and whatever that life is, I'm happy with. You know, I just, I just wanted it to be out and wanted it to be said. And uh, in the past when I've read some poems, uh, from my other books that have had to do with adoption. I have had some some adoptive mothers come up to me and uh, some of them wanted to talk, some of them were not happy. And I've had some good um, good experiences, good conversations. And, and that to me, that's the best thing that can happen. Um, they weren't all happy conversations, but uh, as I said, um, and as you said, I'm not writing about them, I'm writing about my experience, and um, and uh, and I can understand if if adoptive parents might it might 
affect them or offend them in some way at times. Um, but you write about nuances in there um, that people may not think about. You know, pe the fact that you didn't look like your adoptive family. You know, and the feelings that the, that, that generates within you. Um, you know, what do you do with those feelings? How do you, what do you do when, and children can be pretty nasty at school. Um, let's face that, you know, whether it was back many, many years ago, but things haven't changed. Children can be pretty nasty, and that's very tough for a child who may not be able to talk about how that makes them feel at home, um, you know, or to anyone else for that matter. And uh, and that has all kinds of psychological uh, um uh, complications that it can that it can cause and so you touch on those things very very candidly uh, yeah. and I think it'll help other people yeah I I've gotten a, a lot of emails from adoptees who who are saying that it's it's really helping them and and saying some things that they haven't seen before and that uh, that it's really you know <clears throat> It's that they've gotten the book and it's made them feel like they're part of something for the first time. They're part of, a, you know, a family of adoptees, you know, because that's the whole thing. We're not really part of a family. And uh, family is often a dirty word for adoptees. Whereas <clears throat> the adoptive parents think that they've made, sometimes think that they've made everything just fine and it's not fine. And uh, that's part of the message. And what I'm lobbying for is conversations and talking about it, you know, with the adoptee, you know, before they're 40 years old, you know, um, and telling them who they are. Because walking around and not knowing your name, not knowing um, your background, your medical history, is not a good feeling. It's a really lonely, lost feeling. And uh, um, even, you know, and it's, and you know, it still um, affects me. Like, I, I still don't know my medical history. When I make medical decisions, I've made serious med medical decisions um, based on not knowing things. And, you know, that really angers me, but, you know, that's just the way it is. And, um, um, you know, um, I'll, I'll, you know, it's personal, but it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's in the book where, you know, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, I had a hysterectomy and the doc, they were asking me about medical history. I said, I don't know. And um, I said, just take everything out because I don't know. And that's kind of a big decision. <laughs> <laughs> And, it is. Um, that's, that's quite massive. And, you know, when a doctor says to you or somebody says to you and you say, I don't know, you know, it opens up a can of worms um, for you that you, is there ever really a good time to open that can of worms? There isn't. <laughs> no. No. You no. know. And every time somebody asks you something, you know, you you literally, literally spend your life with this identity crisis. Um of not knowing. And what makes us human is that sense of belonging. Everybody wants a sense of belonging. So it's yeah. like you kind of feel like, who do I belong to? Where do I fit in? You know? Um, and that's and that's tough. And I think a lot of people would thank you for writing so candidly um, about your story and opening up the can of worms that others may not have felt comfortable enough uh, to do. Um, so, you know, great job on, on this book. And I would encourage anyone watching either live or on the replay um, to go and grab a copy because I think it's a useful resource for anyone um, out there who's currently feeling lost because they're in a similar situation because you're not the only one. I know that. <laughs> I know that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. But thank you so, so much for um, for spending this time with us. I think we could easily talk for an hour, if not more, <laughs> if we really went into 
um, into the book, but you've given us a little bit of a glimpse. And so I want to thank you for that. Thank you for, for being on the show with us. And um, congratulations on getting your book out into the world. Thank you, Bridgetti. I appreciate it. All the best. It's, it's a pleasure. And to anyone else watching the show, um, a huge big thank you for, for watching us live or on the replay. Um, and I would encourage you to go and grab a copy of this book. For now, thank you for staying with us. Take care. And until next time, we will see you on the next episode of the Writer's Corner live show. <music>